Well, hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. We apologize for the short delay there. We were having some te technical difficulties. Today we began our series on building resiliency. And this is gonna be a series of webinars designed to help uh, you develop resiliency on your farm or ranch. We're gonna have a wide array of different topics in this series. Uh, on September 23rd, we'll have a webinar, the relationship between water, carbon, and biology. And then we'll follow that up uh, with webinars on ranch resiliency, epigenetics, and farm and ranch profitability. So before we begin this evening, I just want to remind you to please leave your microphones on mute. And if you have questions uh, for today's guests or any of the Understanding Ag team, you can please put them into the Q&A box. With that, I'm gonna roll right into it and introduce our presenter for the evening, Eric Fuchs. Eric and his wife, Leanne, live in Southeast Missouri where they have a ranch. And Eric has a long history of working in the area of source water protection. And it was because of Eric's expertise in water quality issues and in water protection that we asked him to join the Understanding Ag team. He has a, a, a wide array of experience in both that regard and in the regenerative ag field. So with that, I would like to introduce to everyone, Eric Fuchs. Eric. Thank you, Gabe. I, I tell you what, it's an honor to be here. And I have to say, uh, most places I've worked, it's been at least two or three years before they actually pronounce my name right. So I really appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, like he said, just a little bit about me from Southeast Missouri. We've uh, got a contract, uh, we contract raising and cattle and have a sheep operation in the Ozark Hills. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn off my video because we have limited cell service around here. So I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started here. So resiliency, this is quite a topic and I was really glad to get to get to do this. So the first thing on resiliency is I thought well, we need to... Oh. Excuse me, Eric, but yes. your slides are not showing. Okay, well, I shared my screen. Let's try it again. How about now? There, it's coming. There we go. Okay, so let's thank get you. to the... Thank you, yeah. Let me get to presenter mode. We there? It is perfect, Derek. Okay, thank you, Gabe. So resiliency, I thought the first thing we need to look this up in the dictionary and see what it means. So it's the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties or toughness. And I added my two cents in there being the cause and not the effect. You know, whether it's drought, floods, wildfire, or anything else, we want to be have our operations to the point to where we are not the effect of them. We want to be able to, to keep on and make a profit, uh, recover, and, and be ready for the next season. So one of the, what I'm going to really kind of dig in on here is mainly in regard resiliency in regards to the water cycle, or as I put in here, the lack of one. So uh, a couple of things I'm going to talk about is growing crops out of context, give us some historical perspective of the way things used to look compared to how they do now. Uh, irrigation and depletion of our water resources. And as Gabe said, I get quite a bit involved in drinking water quality. So we're gonna talk about some pollution of our water resources, floods and drought. Then, you know, the cost to the consumer with this degraded water cycle. So land degradation. Uh, this is the map I pulled up that shows just how degraded lands are all over the world. And, and I do want to say, we just do not own this problem in the United States. This is a worldwide problem, of how we've got to the point of degraded land. And you can see all the different areas and the United States really does stand out with you. While we are able to grow a lot of crops and, and grow a lot of cattle and raise a lot of food, 
how resilient are we as a whole, as a country, to go down this road? Uh, so why why are we why are we degraded? What things are happening where we're hurting the water cycle? So first thing is is definitely too much disturbance. As you drive around this country, you can see that firsthand. Too much tillage, too much disturbance, too much use of synthetics. And I tell you, this has been an eye opener to me in the first month here with understanding ag of seeing exactly what's happened. You know, what happens to the nitrogen that is fall applied all over this country? What happens to the manure that is applied in fall with no ground cover, no growing crop? We see a lot of adverse effects of this. Diversity or lack thereof, very little diversity around this country. And I just love this picture from California. This is diversity for them. We actually have something growing here. And then the one that's really rampant is overgrazing. So we've seen a lot of rains lands like this in brittle environments. But how about in non-brittle environments like ours? We see a lot of overgrazing. And uh, this is probably more of the norm of the, than the exception. So all these things contribute to an operation that is not resilient, plus really damages the water cycle. So what's the results of our management? Some people have droughts, some people have floods. I've uh, been doing the calls from the Soil Health Academies, and this year all the Alabama folks, they couldn't plant because of it's too wet. When I would call the Iowa folks, Minnesota folks, they were having terrible times with drought. So it seems like this is a, a never ending thing. I, I watch the drought monitor quite a bit and it seems like the West is always in drought. So, you know, is it the weather extremes we're talking about or is it a broken water cycle? So I did a little research on, on tiling and, and as everybody can see as they're driving around, this has happened more and more all the time. Well, this happened to be taken in a picture as in North Dakota. This is in a 20 inch rainfall environment and we're laying tile down. So we're either trying to get rid of the water in a rainfall area of 20 inches that then we don't have enough later on. And so, you know, is it, is it weather extremes again or is it a broken water cycle? So we've all seen this one time or another. And so what I wanna, you really look at here is this is, this is a picture of the water cycle and we're looking at this as much as anything. I think there's two things to this water cycle that we're really having problems with. That's evapotranspiration. There's too much sometimes, not enough other times. But this right here, infiltration. How much water do we actually infiltrate around the country, around the world, or our operations? And when you, you know, we get a lot of talk about the cities and concrete and problems uh, that come from those type of environments, but how much water do we infiltrate actually in our rangelands and our farmland? So, so farming out of context, water cycle in the context, I did a little research on different places around the United States. So you always think of Wisconsin and being in dairies. Well, actually, California is the number one dairy producer and surpasses Wisconsin by quite a big amount. The number one dairy producing county in California gets 10 inches of rain. Now, is that not out of context? Where does that water come from? It comes from uh, the, uh, groundwater sources and it comes out of things where they have to have snow melt. Same thing with rice. You think of Arkansas in the south with rice. Well, California is number two in rice production. And same thing, where does that water come from? How about corn? We grow a lot of corn out west. I've been in Kansas a lot and we see corn in 20, 30 inch rainfall environments. But what I really found cool in my research is that in the last 20 years, all the increase in corn has not gone to more food, has not gone to more feed, but it has gone to ethanol supplies. So who pays the water bill for all this? Who pays for growing rice, growing cows, growing corn in environments really not you know, conducive to growing in that type of area. So the water cycle is a historical perspective. So, you know, I look, want to look at historical organic matter contents, historical land use. And I, and I think of first of places like West Texas, we've all heard the stories of the grasslands in West Texas. Alejandro is in the Chihuahuan desert. And we think of that as a complete desert. I've read quite a bit about the greening of the Sahara 
So are we really looking to green the deserts or have they been green? Were they productive before? What have we done? What have we changed in those areas? So of course, this is a picture from Gage Ranch and that is a long-term no-till with synthetics on top of his soil that is long-term no-till with cover crops and regenerative tie bag. Look at the difference in that. And, you know, no-till was always the, uh, what we strive for, what we thought we were doing good, but that is like concrete. That is where we get a broken water cycle. There is no way you're gonna infiltrate water and something like that. So again, is it because of lack of rainfall or lack of what we do with our rain? So this is another map that we've pulled off and these are historical organic matter readings before man started screwing stuff up, as I would say. So now why it does say nine, eight percent, you'll see those that doesn't take in consideration all organic matter. And what we've seen that historical in a place like Brown's Ranch is 12%. I have to ask, I said I was going to give Gabe a hard time. Gabe's Ranch is the place that everybody goes to see. It is the the, the standard of what we all want to talk about when it comes to organic matter and regenerative agriculture. And is that a degraded resource? Is he working? Excuse me, Eric. Yes. I, I will just, for clarification though, there, those are the carbon levels. Yes. So organic uh, matter is 58% carbon. So that is why uh, when Eric quotes the 12%, it's higher than what is shown on there. Yeah, that is thank, carbon levels. Thank you, Gabe. I appreciate that, adding to that. And, and and like I say, when we see that, so I don't say that to say, oh, Gabe Brown's got a degrade, working in a degraded environment. I say it more of like, look where we can go. Look what we can get to. I don't think we've even scratched the surface on the capabilities we have or where we can get our ranches. It is unreal how much we've degraded here and all over the world. So when Gabe and I were, were putting this presentation together, he was talking about uh, deep soils all over the country. And he said, well, maybe not in your area of the Ozarks. So I got to doing a little digging and our area till the late 1800s was uh, very heavy in timber. And I just assumed it was very poor soils. What happened, our area actually was, it was very, very productive. And as all the timber was, was cut off and harvested, then it was burned for 20, 30 years afterwards, and we did erode what soil we had. But I actually researched this and it talked about what was in these woodlands. It was a savanna type setting, hundreds of plant species, elk, bison, deer, bear, turkeys, songbirds, and other wildlife. So these were very, very productive areas. And now why all we have now is dense wood, and they're, they're somewhat of a desert to what they grow. We don't have near the grazing animals or open areas that we used to. So we have totally degraded this environment to where we don't have production. So water cycle and irrigation. We hear a lot about the Ogallala Aquifer and inefficient uh, irrigation. So again, I've done quite a bit of work with David out in Kansas, and I am absolutely astounded on the decisions on when and when not to irrigate. Things from, well, we have to irrigate because we'll get behind if we don't. Things of, well, we have to have our proving period, so we'll just go ahead and put water out there to irrigate. These are in areas that have limited water resources and they're not coming back. The California infrastructure, that was built years and years ago. And a lot of what you hear about the drought, about the problems out there is not that, that there is a drought. There's always a drought out there. It's the fact that they have old infrastructure they wanna rebuild. So who pays for all this? Who pays for that irrigation water? And does, does the irrigation in places like Kansas and Nebraska, do they change precipitation patterns in other areas of the United States? So inefficiencies of irrigation. So I look at that top photo and the first thing I see is mountains in the background. Irrigation. That is the most inefficient type of irrigation we can get. And what cycle? What does this do to salinity levels that we're seeing increase everywhere? Same thing on the bottom picture. One of the most inefficient forms of irrigation. We see most people irrigating during the day. How much leaves with evaporation? 
very, very inefficient the way to do it. And this is what most people think of greening the desert. And uh, anybody that has looked or seen Alejandro's uh, uh, ranch down in uh, Chihuahua, New Mexico, or Mexico, that's greening the desert. This is not. This is out of context. And this is using water resources that are being depleted very quick. So I've got some maps here to show you that this is just not a United States problem. So this is the depletion of Ogallala. And you see the reds are uh, anywhere from 100 to 150 foot that they're having to go deeper. Uh, the shades, it, it's, the, it's actually being depleted all over. And for anybody that doesn't understand or know, the Ogallala is what they consider very, very old water that is left over from the old ice age or the last ice age. This is not water that is the, that is recharged very quickly, if at all. And when we talk about our water cycle and infiltration ability of our soils, it's not something that's going to happen quick. This is just the whole United States taken in. You see the Ogallala, but also you see in California, it's huge uh, depletion of the water table out there, with, along with land subsidence. Even in the more eastern part, with higher rain areas, Memphis is having a lot of problems with their water table going down and not being able to uh, furnish water for the city of Memphis. And then on the world level, these are all groundwater that is either being depleted or is, is being depleted much quicker than it's being regenerated. And most of this is all, again, old water. This doesn't come back. What happens when this is all gone? So I put this in for two things. Of course, this is a picture that we've seen many times and we like to use it. This is Alejandro's ranch down in Mexico. This is a 20,000 acre ranch, which you think in the size of uh, creating your own rainfall is a pretty small area. So when I say two ways, I think we can create rain. We have seen major shifts in our rainfall patterns in Missouri. We get these six, eight inch rains in a couple hours or three or four hours where we didn't get these before. And personally, I think it's changing patterns and humidity levels that are happening in Kansas and Nebraska from all the irrigation water. But what can we do to, to rekindle or get our rainfall patterns back where they need to be again? And that's what we're seeing in Alejandro here. He is actually getting more rain on his place than his neighbors based off what he's got growing there and the regeneration of that area. So I throw this in just to show you that I feel every corner I go around when I think I've seen everything, I, I haven't. So out in Kansas, David and I were driving around and, and I looked over at some fields and I said, man, David, I swear that has been moldboard plow. I thought all plows had been put in the tree lines or the fence rows a long time ago and sold for scrap. But that's a picture of a 14 bottom plow and this guy had three of them and the amount of ground that's plowed up there is, is tremendous. The picture on the left is a combine with a built-in hay baler or straw processors, I should say. So we can take the chaff right off the field and bale it up. And all these things are huge parts of, of breaking or are messing up our water cycle. And that's just, we see this more and more all the time in Kansas. We got to get that wheat straw baled and, and sold. So taking more carbon off the field. So nitrogen in the water cycle and the pollution of resources. This is big. I, I never realized how bad this nitrogen problem is, again, until you drive around or until you work in the drinking water world. So I'm gonna pick on Iowa here a little bit, but this is a world problem. This is not just an Iowa problem, a United States problem, but 55% of the nitrates in the Gulf of Mexico come from Iowa. 626 million pounds of nitrates per year. Land application, I was amazed that they can apply manure on land in the fall with nothing growing. There is nothing to hold it there, nothing to keep it from going away. So it's not, like I said, just a United States problem. There's 400 dead zones across the world and the Baltic Sea is by far the biggest. When we think of gulfs, we used to think of, of huge fisheries and, and one of the most diverse places that you could have. That's not that way anymore. And that is mainly from nitrogen and phosphorus. Harmful algal blooms on a smaller scale we see those in small drinking water or places as big as like uh, Toledo, Ohio and Lake Erie. So I, I pose this question 
Is the water cycle broken because of too much nitrogen or do we use too much nitrogen because we have a poor water cycle? And I think it's a little bit of back and forth, but it's definitely something that is exasperated and it just continues to get worse. So this is a map of the nitrates that actually leave the ground or nitrate issues within the United States. Of course, you see it's within the Corn Belt and it's within the, the uh, watersheds in Missouri and Mississippi River. So these are areas that are contributing the darker spots of the more of what's leaving the ground. And there is nothing, you know, we, we'll lose half our nitrates in most instances on row crop fields, you know, up to 40% of the nitrogen we apply, the plant is not even used in the first year. So if there's nothing growing there, there's no root to hold that in. What keeps that from going into our resources? As I mentioned before, we see lots of application of anhydrous in the fall. What keeps it there? I know we use stabilizers, but the, there is nothing, no living plant to keep it in place. I just have to show this picture of the dead zone. A lot of policy is coming because of this dead zone. A lot of rules are coming from this dead zone. And I have worked in water and wastewater for eight years. And unfortunately, these problems are not from the cities. These problems are coming from non-point pollution and agriculture lands. That's where most of it, and it's from a broken water cycle. So I'm gonna get on a little more of a local level. David and I were working out in Kansas. And so we've been doing quite a bit of testing on uh, the irrigation wells out there. So this was just one that we actually stopped and I'm not gonna tell the town, but we tested the municipal water supply of a local town and tested between 20 and 25 parts per million. Now, this is out of groundwater and 10 parts per million is actually the legal limit that drinking water you can provide for your residents. And as we were driving around testing some others, we just happened to stop in and get a little cup of coffee at, at uh, Casey's. And this was the highlight on the paper, Pratt leaders work on plan to address rising nitrate levels. And if you read the article further, the way they're gonna address it is they're gonna build a different water plant. They're gonna put a nitrate removal or reverse osmosis. And in a town the size of Pratt, we're probably talking, oh, anywhere from three to $5 million. And so the broken water cycle, too much nitrogen, who pays for this? Should every citizen of that town be the ones that pay for this problem? Now I'm talking a little bit about floods and droughts. Are they man-made or is it a poor water cycle? I rem I'm not that old and I remember as a kid, our little creeks ran all year long. We had floods, yes, but nothing like we do now. We have 500 year floods every year and every July and August, we are dry. It is a vicious cycle that I do believe we create ourselves. And when you start traveling the country like we do, when you start putting a shovel in the ground and see how hard everything is, it is amazing to see how broken a water cycle is. Again, this is not just a United States problem. I don't know if anybody listened to the news, but Europe and Germany had some of the worst floods they had ever had. Huge rainfall events, massive devastation over there. So. Droughts in Australia, intensive droughts. And again, are these caused by us? Just like to use the drought monitor here and show again, uh, Gabe can speak very well to this. I believe he said they've had a little over three inches of rain so far this year. I let him know that as of now, he's got the same average rainfall as the Sahara Desert. And while he has not had any rain, he has still been able to graze cattle he's still been able to grow some crops. For the most part, people can't do anything with that. And we see these maps every single year. Governors together, so this, for the first time, they've really started limiting uh, water to the cities. Uh, Lake Mead is the lowest level it has ever been. The Colorado River is the lowest level, a lot of irrigation. But how much that irrigation you use to grow alfalfa, you use to grow corn, used to grow things throughout a context for the areas that the Colorado River runs through. So I wanna to talk just a little bit about money. Who pays for this? What all does this cost? How big of an issue is this in the United States and around the world? So I look at what the cost of the broken water cycle, in the public world, there's always engineered solutions. 
So we see the government programs of agriculture, this engineered solutions of terraces and underground outlets and tiling. We either have to move the water off, we have to stop it from going down too fast, but we spend lots of money on programs because of a broken water cycle. FEMA, I used to work in emergency management. The amount of money spent on floods, the amount of money that we spend to do buyouts so there's no more floods again or people aren't affected by that. The FEMA budget is having to be supplemented every year because of more floods and damage that they cause. The Corps of Engineers, two years ago, I think two or three years ago, we had some of the worst flooding ever on the Missouri River. Uh, we had the rains out in Nebraska on the frozen ground and had tons of flooding. The solution for the Corps, I've been to meetings, build bigger levees. That's the way we solve it. But believe it or not, the Corps and FEMA is actually looking at more what they would call natural solutions uh, to solve these problems because they can't keep building or affording to build bigger levees. Cities and towns, all these little towns, I say all these little towns, a lot of little towns are impacted by flooding. Uh, my little town here, I'm in a county of about 10,000 people, and we've had floods that devastate folks around here. And it, we just see those cycles happening more and more. And then we see the humanitarian crisis, especially all around the world. South Africa, one of the first times a couple years ago, came very close to running out of water for the entire, I believe it was Johannesburg, South Africa. There is no more water and there's no more solutions. And we see places like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Australia, all those are constant droughts and creating humanitarian type crisis. So I got some what ifs here. So what if there was no nitrogen tomorrow? We're talking about resiliency. So, so I talked about cause and effect. We don't want to be the effective thing. What if there was no nitrogen tomorrow? How would you farm a ranch? What if I can't use irrigation? We know, we see the numbers. We know that we're going to deplete the Ogallala Aquifer. We know we're depleting water out in California, but yet nothing has changed. We, we, we track them now. We know how much is going out. But what if we can't use irrigation? What if I'm held accountable for downstream pollution? When is it going to change where they're going to say no more when my nitrates are 25 parts per million and I'm having to spend five or $10 million on a water plant. What if we're held accountable for that? So all of our decisions are based off degraded systems and every decision is compounding cascading effects. So when I say all of our decisions, not only by us as producers, but also the people that sell things to us. So all of our research, our crops, the way we irrigate, the amount of fertilizers we use, everything is based off a degraded system. It's based off a broken water cycle. When we change and start regenerating our land, regenerating our soil, regenerating our soil, look at how things change. Look at all the things we quit having to do. We cannot continue on the same way. So my last slide, I'll go back to resiliency. And uh, Gabe said this, this made his head hurt when I thought about this, but when I kept looking at the definition of resiliency, it says the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties or toughness. Really what we want is how not to have to be resilient. If we change what we're doing now, if we use the six principles, if we use regenerative techniques, we don't have to recover from difficulties because we don't have any. We don't have these droughts all the time. We don't have these floods. And it is really that simple. You do this on a large scale. The amount of production we can have around the world, it is not an either or. You can have high yields, you can graze a lot of cattle, and you can have regenerative type soils. And so that's what we're looking, how not to be resilient. So it is our responsibility as producers, and I know sometimes I'm preaching to the choir when I'm talking to folks like you, but it takes every single one of us. I do not want to see things pushed on us. We have the tools, we have the expertise, we just have to have the drive to go forward to do it. We can be more economically sustainable, we will not have to rely on the government 
and we can continue to make money, but it is our responsibility. We can't rely on others to make the decisions for us forever. So upcoming webinars, Gabe, I'm gonna leave this. I think you talked a little bit about this, but here's what we're getting ready to have. Gabe, I'm gonna turn it over to you for this. All right, thank you, Eric. If you, we do have upcoming webinars on September 23rd. Uh, Shane New and myself will be hosting a webinar, the relationship between water, carbon and biology. And then watch our schedules on Understanding Ag and Soil Health Academy. Following that, we'll have webinars on Ranch Resiliency by Alejandro Carrillo, Epigenetics with Dr. Alan Williams, and Farm and Ranch Profitability with Burke Tyker. So uh, before we get started on the question and answers uh, this evening, I'm gonna ask a question to each of our panelists here. I would like to know what they think of when they hear the word resiliency. David Kay, I'll start with you. Well, you know, the, the Webster Dictionary sums it up pretty well on how do we handle uh, and how do we recover from stressful events. And, you know, when I think about being re resilient, it's, it's building strength, really, uh, to handle those those weather events or whatever. Um, one of the things Eric said here in the last couple slides was how would we farm if we didn't have those nitrates? And, you know, it, that even goes into, would we farm the same way that we are today if we didn't have the, you know, if we didn't have the, the reliance on the, um, you know, any of the crop insurance or other farm bills or anything like that? And so, you know, how, how would we farm a ranch differently if we didn't have that? So I think about all of that when it comes into resiliency, but even looking at, you know, hybrid and variety selections that can handle different events and, uh, and even genetic selection there. Very good, thank you, David. Shane, what do you think of? I'll look at it a little bit differently. You know, resiliency, you know, we're talking resiliency within our soils, you know, to recover from, you know, events uh, such as drought and maybe even flooding. But, you know, I'm going to look at it a little bit differently. Resiliency of, you know, someone changing their mindset about how they work or how they produce food, you know, within this country. And it's a challenge. And that's what I love about regenerative agriculture. And I know I've made this statement many times, but it's a thinking man and woman's game. You've got to be able to think through this and you've got, and you're going to have, and that mental toughness, it's going to challenge you, but it's going to take education to advance and move forward. Very good. Alejandro, what do you think of when you hear the word resiliency? Well, you know, we, we went through a very tough uh, dry spell last year, and we learned quite a few lessons there. Um, it was a big stress test on each of us management. So one thing is that um, those ranchers that were able to uh, have uh, water on pretty much every acre were able to actually have the flexibility to adapt. So water is really a big driver factor when you're uh, trying to adapt to the new conditions and uh, genetics play a big role on it. Uh, so for me, actually uh, resilience is, is um, not worry much about, uh, to a certain degree, you know, about uh, how much water I get because the better we manage, the more consistent results will be. I do remember when we joined the ranch and we, uh, back in 2004, and we got 20 inches on that 10 inch uh, area. We did not do much. And nowadays we are uh, on the right time, obviously uh, with six inches, we're done for the whole year. So for me, that's uh, resilient. I mean, uh, not having to need so much resources to make, to make uh to make it very good alan yeah i'm gonna 
piggyback a little bit off of what Alejandro just said, uh, but resiliency is the ability to be able to both produce and thrive longer into challenges and stressors like drought, extreme rainfall, floods, temperatures, things like that, and the ability to recover much more quickly afterwards. So what happens with real resiliency is that we greatly shorten the time period that our ecosystems are severely stressed because of that ability to last longer into the stress period and to recover much more quickly after the stress period. And as Alejandro so accurately pointed out, it's also the ability to be able to do that without having to spend money on a lot of outside inputs. Very good, Alan. And I will just add my thoughts in there a bit. I think it's important for all of us to think of resiliency, not only from an ecosystem standpoint, but also from a farm and ranch standpoint. You know, I really don't think farms and ranches are resilient if they're not being transferred to the next generation, whether that be a family member or not. I think resiliency needs to be carried beyond just the ecosystem. And we need to look at it in terms of profitability. And one of the issues we have in agriculture today is the fragmentation of our farms and ranches. True resiliency, we should not be fragmenting uh, these pieces like we are. With that, we're going to move on to the question and answers. So please, if you have questions for any of the Eric or any of the panelists, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box. Robert wants to know if he can be provided with access to this presentation. He would like to share this with others. Robert, if you contact Kathy with a K at understandingag.com, we will see if we can do that for you. Zach says, I live in Northwest Nebraska and have pivots pulling from the Ogallala. Have uh, been a corn and bean operation for a long time. I just bought the farm and, and, and am working on moving to Regen Ag, but in the middle of a drought. Where do I start working towards resiliency? Eric, we will start with you. Well, I tell you what, the first thing is, is good on you for trying to go down that road or, or willing to be going down that road. Uh, the, the first thing for, for me, and I, I know we get tired, of, people get tired of hearing us say this, but education, I would absolutely read look as much as you can. Gabe has got some great videos. I know other people do. Attend the Soil Health Academy. It will be the best money you ever spent because once you learn the why, once you understand the basic principles, once that clicks, there is no turning back. And I, I think that is number one in everything you do. Thank you, Eric. David, would you please answer also. Yeah, I'd echo kind of what Eric said. Education is huge on that. Um, you know, simply following the principles. Um, you know, the principles are in place because no matter where you are, they're always going to be the same. Uh, whereas products are always going to be different from wherever, you know, in practices. They're always going to be different from from uh, different parts of the country, different parts of Nebraska, anywhere. Um, you know, but if you can start with getting a cover crop in, you know, and planning that for your crop rotation, keeping that ground covered as much as possible, you'll start storing more of that water in your soil profile as you start to build that aggregate structure. And over time, you'll really start to see um, those advancements. And, and really, with the cover crop and keeping the ground covered, uh, it doesn't take that long. We've got some aquaspy uh, soil moisture probes down in Kansas and monitoring some fields that have just been, you know, a year or two, uh, two years into using cover crops and the amount of infiltration that we're able to see with that and storing water in that 
profile is amazing. So, you know, we've got tools now that we can monitor and measure these advancements. And I'd encourage anybody to, to take a look at using them. Very good, David. I would just add, Zach, that on September 23rd, our webinar will focus on just what you're asking. How do we start uh, enhancing the water cycle, enhancing biology, and cycling carbon in order to build this resiliency? Next question is from an anonymous attendee wanting to know, do you think crop insurance and federal farm subsidies like the recent COVID payments in 2020 play a big role in preventing the conventional farmers from trying or looking towards regenerative ag practices? Goes on to say, seems there should be payment reductions for folks not using regenerative practices. Okay, who, Eric, since you were the presenter this evening, I'll let you start. How far can I go with this, Gabe? <laughs> as far as you want. <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm writing a, a set of articles now on just this very thing of the uh, unattended consequences of, of farm programs and the farm bill. I, I think crop insurance, I think government payments, and I'm not going to sit here and say that I've not taken some myself, but I think they are absolutely the biggest detriment for us and for our road down that direction. Policy has to change. We are constantly rewarding bad behavior. And when you reward bad behavior, you get more bad behavior. Crop insurance has made places be farmed that should never be farmed, ground that is put in production that should never be put in production. CRP, I, I, I could go on and on and on, but in a nutshell, that is one of the worst things. And straps a farmer and makes him less resilient than probably any other thing available. It, it, I think the farm bill probably affects each individual in this country, every individual, more than any government policy that's around. Thank you, Eric. Any of the other panelists want to hop in on that one? Gabe, I'll just share real quick that with everyone that uh, we've been meeting extensively since February with Secretary Vilsack uh, to talk very specifically about alterations in how the farm bill is, you know, making payments, incentives, all of these other things. And, and these are the types of things that that we have talked very pointedly about, that presently you're exactly correct. The, the way things are set up, it actually does incentivize poor behavior by a lot of farmers. I mean, that, that's just the fact. And I think most people would, would readily admit to that. Uh, the thing that we have tried to impress the most upon Secretary Vilsack is the fact that Farmers cannot implement what they do not know. So incentive payments to do something, to implement a practice that they're not really familiar with and comfortable with doesn't do a lot of good. If we're going to have incentive payments, it must be first accompanied by and preceded by education. Then that is tied to their ability to, qual to qualify for those payments. So, so those are the types of things that we're discussing right now. Uh, it's still government, it's still politics, and who knows where all of this will go, but at least it is being talked about. And thank you, Alan. And I would just add to that, you start by setting an example yourself. None of the partners of understanding ag accept any government subsidies, even COVID payments. So you, you have to set an example yourself. Next question is from Dalton. And I am going to, um, let's see. Here we go. Dalton asks, why are perennial undersown nitrogen fixing cover crops not implemented more often? 
sea drills and other ex equipment, et cetera, can still do what needs to be done. Shane knew, why aren't we not using more nitrogen fixing cover crops? It's not nitrogen, it's carbon. So let's talk about that real quick. <clears throat> you know, when we use, say, a perennial legume, remember that legume is producing a lot of nitrogen. That nitrogen is being utilized by the soil microbiology, especially the bacteria. And so as we have an increase of nitrogen within our soils, their affinity for that nitrogen is very strong. So they're gonna capture that nitrogen, then they're gonna start consuming carbon. So, you know, there, remember there's billions, billions of soil organisms in a healthy teaspoon of soil. So they're all consuming, especially the bacteria, the nitrogen. But as they take one bite of nitrogen, they're taking three to five bites of carbon. So what that leads to is no aggregation in our soils, which starts leading to what we just talked about this evening, a broken water cycle. And not only a broken water cycle, a broken nutrient cycle, it, it breaks the energy cycle, it breaks all these cycles within the system. So, and I'll let Alan explain a little bit more and allude to this, but it's very detrimental. These systems were never high nitrate systems. Never. Go ahead, Alan. Yeah, so Shane, you're exactly right. Uh, again, we talk a lot about historical ecological perspective. And when you look at native grasslands and prairies all over the world, they were never high lagoon, ever. Uh, you know, at best, they were 10 to 12% lagoon in the mix and, and, and then grasses and actually a much higher percentage of forbs and broadleaves than we would have imagined, you know, up to 30 to 40% forbs and broadleaves. Rather, what, what occurred at that point in time is we had a lot of free living nitrogen fixers in association with a lot of the grasses that performed much of that function. So Shane is absolutely correct. And, and we work with a, a lot of different types of farming operations. And, and one of those are, are dairies. And many, many dairies around North America and, and frankly, many other countries of the world are planting a lot of alfalfa. And the worst fields, quite frankly, that we go into are these monoculture alfalfa fields. These three, four, five-year-old alfalfa stands, the soil is as hard as a rock. It's crusted on top, heavily plated, little to no aggregate, and very poor water infiltration. And we just see this over and over. So it's very, very easy to overdo lagoons and brassicas. We've got to be super careful about that. Very good points, Alan. The next question, David, I'm going to uh, ask you to answer this one. Maria would like to know, she would like to hear more about devices that monitor water infiltration. They have made a lot of management changes that visually reduce runoff, but they want to know how to prove this. David? Yeah, so what we're using is the AquaSpy, the soil moisture probes. They're a probe that go into the ground about four feet, and there's sensors every two inches that monitor, um, you know, soil moisture, rooting depth, um, electrical conductivity, and, um, and temperature. And so, you know, it's been a really good tool. I know there's a lot of other soil moisture probes out there on the market. Um, I, I just kind of liked what this one all had to offer. And especially with the sensors being two inches that we could really see uh, some differences throughout that profile with different management practices. Um, like this winter, we had them in, some installed back in January. And when they got to uh, think with the wind chills, it was 25 below zero and everything. Some of those soils that had good armor never got below, um, I think it's 34, 35 degrees. Um, so that is really interesting. As far as uh, the moisture this year, we've been able to see that, you know, we get a half inch of rain and we might be able to see it infiltrate down 16, 18, 24 inches easily. So um, where other fields with 
um, whether it's just straight no-till or with, with tillage may have only infiltrated in about four inches to maybe six to eight inches at most. So seeing some really cool things there and that's something we could potentially maybe share later again. Okay, thank you, thank you, David. Do you wanna mention a little bit, uh, just run through briefly on how to do a infiltration ring test? Yeah, so what you can do is find a six inch diameter tube, um, you know, whether it's uh, off of an irrigation, um, you know, um, right. tube or, or an unloading auger off a grain bin, or you can order them online as well. And what we do is we drive that in three inches um, and pour roughly a one inch of water in there. So we take a, you know, a, a 16 ounce water bottle, um, pour a little bit out because it's supposed to be like 444 milliliters of water to equal one inch of water into that tube. Um, you'd line that tube with uh, on top of the soil with like saran wrap, um, pour the water in there, pull the saran wrap off and start a, a stopwatch on your phone or whatever and just, just calculate and watch how fast your water goes in. And you can run that test multiple times to to get an estimate of how quickly uh, you're able to absorb water into your soil profile. Thank you, David. I'm gonna direct the next question to Alan. Garrett asks, he says, I'm currently a doctoral student in poultry science with masters in general agriculture. Over time, I have been became disenchanted with modern agricultural practices, yet I have fallen in love with regenerative practices. I currently do not see very many faculty in academia and even fewer in the field doing regen ag. What are the potential job opportunities in academia or the field for graduates seeking a future in regenerative ag? Alan? So first of all, Garrett, uh, I agree with you. <laughs> as a former academic and as I, as I like to refer to myself now, a recovering academic, uh, you're, you're exactly right. You know, much of what has been done in academia over the last 30 plus years, and certainly including right now, is very reductionist in nature. And we have forgotten to look at systems and things as a whole. We have parsed things down to such minute parts that frankly, we, we can't see the forest for the trees anymore as, as research scientists and academicians. So, but what I will say to you though, is that the opportunity for people in the regenerative field is growing significantly. Uh, we, we get calls every week for people looking for qualified people in regenerative agriculture. So the employment opportunities are growing very rapidly. Now, that being said, they're not growing very rapidly yet in academia, uh, but they are growing very rapidly in practically every other sector. So on farm, on ranch, uh, there's a lot of companies now that are looking for people to help lead them through their regenerative efforts. Uh, there's also uh, investment funds that are looking for people and, and these types of opportunities are, con are gonna continue to grow. So get your education, but do it always taking everything with a grain of salt and then get your practical education. That is what is going to be most important for you to advance yourself in a career in regenerative agriculture. Very good. Thank you, Ellen. Tracy has a wheat farm in Oregon. And on that wheat farm, there's currently a a very small, slow flowing stream with a little bit of vegetation around it. It's been basically ignored. What can she do to enhance that natural water cycle? Eric? Well, the, the first thing I would tell her is, is, you know, put regenerative methods on the rest of the place and that will do more to enhance that little stream as anything. But if she is looking at just the stream itself, I, I do like setbacks, you know, something, you know, keep as far away from she can't. If she's grazing cattle, 
you know, limited access to that stream, but also use that stream as a paddock. You know, when we built grazing systems here within RCS, they wanted everything out of a stream and then it just grows up. But uh, I, I think you can do as much to regenerate streams or small things like that with livestock as you can anything on a very limited basis. But uh, yeah. Okay, thank you, Eric. Anyone wanna add to what Eric said there? Alejandro, would you have uh, any advice for Tracy to try and jumpstart that, that stream? Yes, Gabe. Um, when we work on, on uh, ranches in the Western US and Northern Mexico, we usually try to start with that, those high carbon, um, what we call low hanging fruit, meadows or uh, draws or riparian areas. And uh, usually that's where the springs used to be. So just by applying this uh, regen uh, ranch in there, you will grow much more forage and most likely you will improve uh, your springs or streams that you have there. Obviously that's gonna also clear the water big time because even in studies where they were trying to find what was the best filter, uh, they they found out that the best filter was actually the a good uh, fertile soil. <laughs> it, it cannot really be outcome with anything else. Very good, thank you, Alejandro. Mike asks this question: How can you educate a farmer when they are when they are multiple generations into hitting the easy button? Farmers have been trained to follow the conventional ag retail recommendations. David. Yeah, so, you know, going back to a previous question with all the payments and everything, it's really funny when people are, are struggling financially, they're looking for, for a way to change. And then all of a sudden now, you know, there's uh, money into to farming and commodity prices are high and people say, well, why do I need to change now? Well, if you've got money now, it's the perfect time to be able to kind of learn and gamble a little bit with that. Um, you know, the, the younger generation, surprisingly, is becoming more interested in regenerative agriculture and soil health. Um, you know, just looking at some trends, it seems like the mid-20s to to uh, young 40 year olds are probably the ones that are asking some of the most questions about it. Um, possibly because when you look at taking over a farm and you start looking at the price of inputs, the price of land, the price of equipment and everything else, you know, you start, it's a daunting, <laughs> it's, a, it's a scary number and you start thinking, well, what else can we do to change? And so, of course, you got guys out there selling some type of a bug and a jug replacement uh, for that egg retail recommendation. But if they dig a little deeper and understand about what, you know, the, the principles of soil health and using the cover crops and, and no-till practices and stuff, they can start to understand how they can really, um, you know, raise a crop at the least cost profitable. Uh, and, and start making more profit. Very, very good, David. I would just add to that. Uh, there were many interesting slides Eric put up in his presentation this evening. And one of them that certainly grabbed my attention was the map that showed the severely degraded land. Did everyone notice that some of the most degraded lands, soils, in the United States, we're in the I states. Okay, why do I bring that up? Well, take a look, the I states, it's pretty much all corn and soybeans, uh, quite a bit of tillage, but they started with inherently rich soil properties and high quality soils, but they've degraded these steadily year by year over time. And so to answer Mike's question is, Many farmers, this is occurring so slowly, they don't really notice. But if you really quiz them on it, 
they will say, well, yeah, things used to be a, a lot better. Recently, I was on a, a multi-generational family farm in Minnesota, and the grandfather told me, well, our soils used to be a lot better when we had oats in the rotation, and now they're just corn and beans. So my point here, Mike, is that this is happening very slowly over time, and farmers don't really notice because they're out there uh, every day. I agree with David that the way to make them stand up and take notice is from a profitability standpoint. At Understanding Ag, we're putting together a lot of case studies that show that if a corn and soybean farmer adds cover crops to his rotation and adds a third crop, preferably a cereal, followed by a cover crop, they're gonna increase their profitability. They're gonna increase water infiltration rates, they're gonna increase and improve their resiliency. And so as long as the government throws copious amounts of money at them, you're right, they're unlikely to change. But one way we can, we can spur that change is by showing them that they could be even more profitable. And as far as I'm concerned, even more importantly, they can uh, improve their ecosystem so that the next generation can farm sustainably. Shane, I'm gonna come to you with this question here from Zach. Why is hay, particularly on irrigated land, not beneficial to soil health? You have no soil disturbance and living roots in the soil. Wondering why it is better to graze these fields and how is grazing them more profitable? Uh, the reason why there's five or, or now six principles with context, because armor on your soil is very important. <laughs> when we remove that biomass through forage production, such as haying, you know, we're gonna heat that soil up tremendously. And as we talked about earlier, you know, we're working with the soil biology, microbiology. One thing it's gonna lead to is a lot of evaporation rapidly. That biology works in the films of water within the soil. Um, so they're no longer gonna be able to function. Uh, this which is gonna go back to cascading events. It's gonna start interfering with our water cycle and the rest of the cycles. But the removing of the biomass is a, is a huge component of why it's bad. Not only that, we're removing all the carbon out of the system too, a lot of that carbon. You know, if we can utilize grazing, those animals, and if done properly, you know, not taking more than 50% of the biomass while we graze, those plants are gonna continually keep pumping carbon into the soil, feeding that microbiology, which is gonna help build soil aggregates. Not only that's gonna help improve the mineral cycle, and we can capture an economic gain from that. You know, we just got done talking about, you know, building resiliency, economics and stuff. I mean, how many guys take into account their overhead cost of producing A versus grazing? I just had a real good conversations today with a producer. You know, we sat here and we run a lot of volume due to the fact we have a lot of payments to make. And we're expecting these animals to make these payments. But if we didn't have those payments, you know, how many animals would we have to be to capture the same amount of profitability if you are even being profitable? So, you know, we got to look at both sides of the ledger is the way I look at it. Very good, Shane. Eric, here's a question for you. Robert states he lives in a county in Ohio where the population is around 40,000. Several of the villages and towns have a wellhead protection plan with recharge areas that are identified, much being in ag land. What examples can you share that these metro areas could consider to improve the water cycle that impacts water supply and impacts flooding downstream that impacts the metro areas? You know, the best luck we had in situations like that, and I can get away from it, get away with it because I farm for a living, but we 100% educated those landowners and as many as we could. You know, farmers aren't out there you know, wringing their hands, driving the tractor saying, let's see how bad I can screw up everybody's water. 
But when you actually educate them on what's happening with the demos, with dollar figures, showing what the consumer in that town is paying for what they're doing or lack of doing, it really makes a big difference. But you have to form those relationships. And with those relationships, I've seen amazing things happen. And one thing I really put on hard is like, and I truly believe this in the bottom of my heart, if we don't do something different in the next four or five years, we're going to see the likes of regulation like we have never seen in our life and we will be forced to do it. So I use that as well. So huge education project. I will be glad to help you with that, give you some suggestions, do some Zooms. I may be talking out of turn here, but I'm passionate about that. And I'm sure there's tons of nitrate problems in Ohio, if I remember right. Thank you, Eric. And Robert, I would say to you, if you want to get in touch with Eric, just uh, email Kathy at understandingag.com. Here's a very interesting question by Martin. In an Arizona type weather, irrigated sandy soils, how high of organic matter levels do we feel can be reached if implementing regen ag principles in a five year time frame? Currently, organic matter levels are below 1%. Who wants to take a swing at that one? Shane, you want to start? I mean, the easy ones. Um, you know, first thing, <clears throat> let's, we got to talk about context. You know, you're in the desert Southwest. So your biology is going to stay much more active than in Northern environments. So it's going to be a little more difficult to build a lot of organic matter. But if we start implementing the principles and being intentional, the big thing is getting that soil armored up, number one, and keep that living root in that soil as much as possible. And in your environment, that's to your advantage. You can grow much longer within a season than a lot of guys in the Northern environment. To sit there and try to make a, a estimated guess is, <clears throat> I mean, that's tough to do. It's all gonna depend on how intentional you are, um, how much diversity you add in your system, animal impact, several factors, but, and I'll let someone else correct me if I'm wrong, but I would think within the three year time frame, you should be able to pull your organic matter levels up by one and a half percent minimum. In a five year time frame. That oh, would sorry, be about right. five year. Yeah, five year time frame, one and a half percent. That would be doable as long as, as Shane said, you're intentional. Um, Shane, do you want to talk about uh, refractometer here? Tracy asks, is there a tool to measure the nutrient levels and pesticide levels in hay crops? A refractometer would be an uh, easy device that you can keep. In fact, you can go to our website and purchase them if you'd like. But basically, <clears throat> take a sample of the forage uh, that you're wanting to gather information on. It's going to tell you the sugar, solids, you know, how nutrient dense that forage is. Um, it's a simple device. You put some sap on top of the screen. You know, it's a refractometer, so place up to light the sun and look at the bricks readings, the scale inside the refractometer. And it'll give you good, good, pretty good idea where the nutritional values are at. Yeah, for pesticide levels, Tracy, you're gonna have to get those tested at a lab. Eric here, Linda has a question. She's wondering if you know of any accurate information or modeling on the potential impact of water cycle solutions across the US that include understanding the return on investment of improving water holding capacity of headwater forest cropland and rangeland versus that of returning stream bank and floodplain storage returning them from residential and industrial uh, versus the heavy industrial mechanical infrastructure fixes. She states, I think that ag has the strongest potential to lead the natural climate solutions, but would love to have, have solid numbers to check my assumptions. That was a mouthful. That was a mouthful. Now, and it's funny because I have gone down that road a little bit. I'm going to a little bit here to maybe Gabe, you and Alan, because I think we are putting a lot of numbers together. Because what 
I have found out there is a lot of scattered things where they have studied this thing or they have studied that thing, but they've not put it together. I will say from a water quality standpoint, regenerative ag, soil health principles, the six principles, fixing the water cycle solves 99% of the water quality problems across the United States and I would say the world. Now that is a pretty bold statement but these principles work. But as far as measurement, Gabe, I'm going to, I'm going to punt that to you and Al. Yeah. And, and we're doing some work on that, but we don't have anything uh, yet that is ready to be shared. Unfortunately. Uh, next questions from Dieter from North Central Alberta. Uh, just got first polycrop this year, pleased with the results in a dry year. Wondering if uh, we can connect him with a uh, dairy that's in a northern environment uh, to ask about transitions. And yes, Dieter, we can certainly do that. Please email Kathy at Understanding Ag and we'll be able to pass on some contact information for you. Happy to do that. Tracy states, I understand yield will improve with Regen Ag, but I feel like marketing the improved nutrient value will be incredibly profitable. Just not sure how to show that value. Tracy, I'll take a swing at this one. Uh, realize that um, I hesitate to say that yield will improve because it's all based on context. And um, too often farmers measure in their mind profitability with yield, but realize that yield usually comes at a cost. So the highest yield may not necessarily be the most profitable and may not necessarily be what's best for the ecosystem. Now, as far as nutrient value, Yes, uh, Understanding Ag is working on several projects that are measuring the phytonutrient compounds that are in uh, grains, vegetables, and pastured proteins. We're looking forward to getting these results out. Uh, I will just let you know that we have been contacted by a number of large businesses that are specifically interested in sourcing products uh, that are grown in and on regenerative, regenerative soils. And the reason being is that they know just what you're saying, that uh, nutrient value and content will improve. And also it'll be a marketing ploy for them with the consumers. This is coming very shortly. Uh, we look forward to being able to share that information with you in the coming months. Anyone else have anything to add to that? If not, I will move on. Ted says, this past year has seen significant numbers of cow-calf come to town as ranchers have been depopulating the herds in dealing with the drought. How well had Brown's Ranch held up? Were you able to hold your cows with the use of a regenerative system? Well, Ted, this is actually our sixth year of well below normal precipitation. Last year was the, uh, the uh, second driest year ever recorded here. This year is both the driest and the hottest ever recorded. We have not had to sell off any of the cow herd. Uh, we did move one potload of uh, yearling steers uh, a couple months earlier than we normally would have, but uh, we're going to be able to maintain most of our uh, cow herd uh, as normal. So it is affecting us. I do not want to say that it isn't because uh, forage production after six years of dry has diminished, but one of the things we're going to talk about in these future webinars on resiliency is that I'm a firm believer you only run as many cows on your ranch as you're capable of running in the driest years you've seen. 
Now, these are the driest years we've seen, so I may adjust numbers down a little bit further, but we run yearlings, uh, more stockers and grass finishers when conditions warrant, and that has allowed us to maintain the cow herd. Uh, we get on a lot of branches all over North America, and I can tell you the vast majority of them run too many cows for their resource space. And because of that, they have to put up feed, feed a lot of process feed. And then when they get into these dry conditions, then they end up having to liquidate at perhaps depressed prices. It comes down to context and we need to uh, understand our context and our resource base. So thank you for that question, Ted. Any other questions? We're about ready to wrap it up. If anyone has any yeah, other yeah. questions. Yes, Alejandro. Yeah, talking, I mean, we, we went to a pretty tough uh, drought last year. And just to give you a comparison of what happened in my ranch and what happened in, in uh, nearby ranches. So like five years ago, oh, my one of my neighbors and I were running about the same number of, of cows, about 600 cows. But uh, we actually felt the, the drought only last year, but he keeps telling me that the drought has been for four years. So he started decreasing his stock numbers uh, to 500, 300, 200, and he ended up with just 100. So we did this stock as well, because what we do is at the end of the growing season, the fall, we try. We, we 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 estimate how much forage we have and how much cattle we have, and that's when we destock. And so we were able to keep um, 550 cows uh, instead of the, and that's only part of the story because my never actually paying those cows for almost a year, so he did not have pretty much any cows on the rangeland. So it does really make a huge difference, uh, regen practices, it does. So we believe that going to the other end, a drought should be actually a time where you make even more profit if we follow a discipline approach and we plan ahead of time. Very good, Alejandro. Alejandro will talk more about that in his webinar on ranch resiliency. Watch our website for that specific date. With that, we're gonna wrap it up for this webinar. We wanna thank everyone on behalf of the team at Understanding Ag and Soil Health Academy. Thank you for attending and we look forward to visiting with you in the future. Thank you.